At this time, we'd like to introduce Jacqueline Block is a Covenant Elite Coach, Mentor, and Speaker. She has taken her experience as a top producing realtor and built it into one of the fastest growing, results-driven consulting companies in North America. With over 80% of her clients at the top 1% of production across the country, Kathleen serves as CEO, speaker, trainer, and elite coach with Kathleen Black Coaching and Consulting. She created and hosts the Ultimate Team Summit. Love the name again, Kathleen. The largest team specific, specific real estate summit in North America, the elite event destination for top producing teams. The system she used in her daily real estate business to get her to the top 1% of North America's largest real estate board and now the backbone of a real estate consulting company. Kathleen Black, coaching and consulting, specializes in helping realtors across North America build top teams and take their business to incredible levels of success. Kathleen was named one of the top 100 elite women driving the future of real estate by REP Magazine and has now been featured in REP Magazine, Rent Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine, ABC, NBC, and Fox News, among many more. Most recently, Kathleen was named in the T360 2018 Top 20 Emerging Leaders as part of the esteemed Swan Full Power 200 Report business leaders that were chosen based on gaining attention amongst industry insiders and who are poised to make big moves that may well change the future of real estate. Kathleen's extensive knowledge of team building and systems has enabled her to successfully coach thousands of top producers to higher productions and hundreds of teams. Many of her clients have now built mega teams that are leading the markets in production. As a highly demanded coach, Kathleen has enjoyed a high retention rate uncommon in the coaching industry with loyal, with loyal clients and a long waiting list for her services and those of, of her coaching team. Please welcome Kathleen Black to the stage. shorter version. Uh, so today's an interesting day for me to listen to all the financials and updates because I'm about to make a major purchase. I always dreamed of having a certain car, so if I'm sweating and shaking a little bit, it's from listening to the financial update as I sign the dotted line to make an investment myself. Um, but today what I'm going to be talking about, uh, I usually focus with teams. Um, how, how many people have heard of our company, our Ultimate Team Summit at all? A couple? Okay. Um, Ultimate Team Summit focuses on um, teams predominantly are selling 100 units or more. How many people here are teams? Just so I can gauge, how many people would like to build a team? Okay, so I would say if you're not on a team and you don't want to build one, today actually isn't just about team building. Often when I do talks, it's about the steps and evolution of building a team. Today we're going to talk a lot about personal leadership, how leadership affects the market, and how leadership comes into teams and how the industry has changed with teams. So you'll all get something from that. How many people would still like to harness some of the results of teams, even if they don't want to be on one? If you're an individual agent, how many people would like to know how are they doing it? Yeah, a few. <laughs> okay, excellent. So today we're going to talk about authenticity, rebellion, and personal power, success by internal leadership. So a couple of the key points we're going to get into is what does personal leadership have to do with massive success in any industry? Why is the consultant's approach more important now in our industry than ever? And what do top teams know that give them greater power in the current market? How can we invest in ourselves in order to create our personal definition for success and contribute by living that example for others? And finally, if your potential re relies on changing old habits, friends, and personal beliefs, are you willing to rebel? Um, I don't know about you, but any success I've ever had in business came with what other people perceive as some pretty big costs. When I first started to run my own business, I took on a partnership with another company and when I came to the opportunity that I could actually run and own it, of course all the books were open and I found out I was about to run a company that was about $160,000 in debt. It may not seem like a lot for you, but for a first time business owner running a small business, I had a little bit of a moment of, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? But it was an amazing experience. Because when you try to turn around a company that's already in trouble, when, you, when I later on sold my shares and started my own company, it seemed like easy peasy, you know, not too, but not too big of a hurdle compared to that. So what I do is I work with teams because I love to work with building what could be. 
I don't love to work with building what is. I love to work with the leaders who have a vision, they're committed, they really want to change the industry, they want to build something, a platform, that's better for other people to run their business than doing it independently. And I'm really passionate about that. So that's taken a lot of leadership, kind of rebellion in my life to support those leaders. So to give you a sense of the kind of clients we work with and our track record, uh, the first couple years in coaching I took on a team at the time, they were doing 27 resale deals. They sold a whole bunch of new construction that was on the side. Two and a half years later, they were selling 186 resale deals. Last year, which is about four and a half to five years later, they sold 557 homes. So we work with mega producers. The people who have built their teams with our platform, some of them are selling 1,000 plus homes per year. So those are the people I get the chance to work with. I'm very grateful for that. So when it looks at, when we look at efficiency and systems, that's our specialty, okay? Just to give you some background on what we do. So if you're looking to build a team, you can check out our events afterwards. I'm not gonna be talking about that now. So we're really passionate about change. And one thing I know is that I can work with systems with let's say 10 people and train them at once. I do a lot of onboard training, which means you come onto a team and you get trained completely in the systems of the team before you ever get a lead. You ever get an opportunity, anything, you're not getting paid. So you have this investment in learning these tools. And what fascinated me was, why can I train 10 people and two of them will just fly? They're ultra successful with the tools, their conversion is you know, through the roof very quickly, and why are the other eight struggling? What's going on? This led me to invest in tools like NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, Mindset Tools, Disc Personality Profiling, because what I found was we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. So if we see the world as limited, if we feel we can't get massive results or we can't build a world-class team, then we probably can't. So a lot of the work I actually do with mega teams is energy work and mindset work and leadership work and communication. Some of the top teams I've worked with for years, I have teams I've worked with since 2009. So if you can imagine, I talk to them every single week. So that's a long time to bring new content. They know the systems. They'll say to me, Kathleen, a buyer comes into the office, it's locked down. Like we sign every single person. It's just not even a conversation anymore. We might do some review, but really like it's, it's not even a topic. So what do you talk about with those people? You talk about what fuels the engine, which is the team, and what do we think that is? What do you think is the top thing? If somebody knew all their systems, like they were total, like, they're not sharks, but they're almost like, you know, killers. Like you put them in the room, they're, they're gonna get consistent results again and again and again. What do you think would be the top things that would power their performance? What do you guys think? No, yes? Yeah. What's this desire? what their desires are, so why, what's important to me. And what's amazing is some of those top teams and the top players on the team, you won't hear them talking about the money. You won't hear them talking about the units. They have desires that are bigger and more important to them personally than that. So yeah, their desires, their energy, their mentality. We spend a lot of time working on what powers them and gets them in optimal state. I don't know about you, but everything that I do well comes from being in an optimal state. Everything that I do horribly comes from letting my energy get too low. Can anybody relate to that? Like you'll never see me go to McDonald's or Burger King when my energy is optimal, that'll never happen. But when I'm tired, I might. And it's the same thing in real estate. So when we have these top producers, if their energy gets low, they might slip up and say something they wouldn't usually. They might skip their presentation, even though they know it gets them amazing results. Right, they might stay out partying and the next day not show up for training. Not if they're my clients, but you know, if there's someone else, they might. So how do we actually change things? We change how we see the world. So I spend a lot of time talking about reclaiming leadership, which I know when you first hear it, it's like, what do you mean, leadership's everywhere? And I say, yeah, you're right, leadership is everywhere. But every time I hear about leadership, the part that's hard for me is everybody's talking about how to lead others, right? How do I lead my team? How do I get them to listen to me? How do I lead people in my brokerage, right? How do I lead my family? And for me, it's a really backwards formula. Because the most important person to lead is actually not anyone else than ourselves, right? The most power that I'm gonna get in my business or in a team is if I'm leading myself. So if I have a team of 20 people and they're all strong leaders, they're all integrous, they have synergy, they're gonna move forward and they're gonna do amazing things because they're not putting all this energy sideways when their, their vision is actually forwards. Does that make sense? So we spend a lot of time on how do I actually lead myself versus everyone else. Without commitment, you cannot have depth in anything, whether it's a relationship, a business, or a hobby. 
One of the many relief reasons I do not have a relationship <laughs> because my commitment is to my business and to my children. So when I started this business, I said, my present business, I said two years, I'm gonna commit, I'm gonna work nights, evenings, all day, I don't care, I'm building this business, that's it, that's all I'm gonna do. And it built 10 times faster than I thought, but I also you know, lived and breathed the business, right? So commitment is required. So when people are going to build these big teams, they think you know they're not going to hit any stumbles. They're going to hit huge stumbles. Business building can be a bit messy. It can be exhausting. You can have hurdles. Your team's going to mirror you. So when you're first learning and building, sometimes we're not the best leaders we want to be, and we lose people, we have strife, things like that. So at the end of the day, it's all going to be in proportion to our commitment levels. So this is kind of cool, and I'm not going to have you guys tell me which box you think you're in. That's not what this is, but I'm going to explain it. So from my experience, um, there's four different categories of where people are at in their lives. And you can be in different categories for uh, you know, different aspects of your life, right? So we have first, average, unengaged. So stagnant, complacent, comfortable. It's like I'm showing up, I'm okay, but I don't really want to expand. I don't really want to change anything. I don't want to invest. So this would be for me downhill skiing. So I go downhill skiing, I love it. I love the time out, I love being in nature, I love anything outside. I know skiing, not quite nature, but you know what I mean. So I go out and my kids will wait, you know, before you go to the next peak and make fun of me. They'll call and be like, you're so slow, what are you doing? We've been waiting for you for half an hour. And I'm like, I love skiing, but am I gonna invest in being the best downhill skier? No, probably not gonna happen. Overmade it, motivated, underachiever. These are the people that most coaching and training companies are thriving off of. So they show up to all the conferences, they buy all the books, they listen to everything, and they love the energy, right? They get pumped up on the energy. And then what happens? What do you think is what happens? When they get home from the conference, or they get home from the training, or they've listened to the you know, 20th Audible that month, what happens then? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happens, right? They're not actually making change. So they're motivated, but they're not, they're not getting an outcome because they're not taking any action. Right? And overwhelmed underachievers. This is typically when people come into my coaching fold, when I get to work with them, because they are applying maximum effort. They're showing up, they're working those 80 hour weeks, they're constantly trying, they're trying to implement, and they're like, I don't get it, because the person across the hall, all they seem to do is play golf, and they're doing double the, the transaction I am, how is this exactly working? Right? So they're applying maximum effort all the time, they're still, still yielding <coughs> minimum results, they have, they're overwhelmed, overstressed, and they're underproducing, and they are perception of it, their perception, right? So our fourth category is where we want to get to, the anti-average, right? Stunningly successful. So they're producing exponentially greater results with shockingly little effort, time, and stress, and they have much more free time. So what do you think the secret might be to get into category number four? What do you guys think? You're in real estate, right? Systems leverage is the future of real estate or the existing. So what do you think they might be doing to get there? Are you guys awake? <laughs> Come on, what do you think? What, any example? Yeah. Having a schedule. Having a schedule. Yes, so if I know what I want, I don't mind creating a schedule that other people might think is a little bit nuts, right? It's like I know what I want, I know my way to get there, I'm going to follow it. I'm not going to sabotage myself. Yeah, I might have a schedule. Prospecting. Yes, their prospecting teams might do some more advanced methods with prospecting and lead generation, but absolutely I'm with you. So prospecting, time management, what else might they have? Think of the most stunningly successful person or team you know in real estate. Systematic. Thank you. Was that fair? Thank you. They are systematic. So they can duplicate what they're doing, right? So when you go in and do a listing presentation, a lot of you are probably extremely talented at it. You have unique talents that you might have had all your life or you might have worked on for some aspects of that. I'll tell you it's next to impossible to duplicate your unique talents to other people. And it's really hard for them too. Because they show up and they try to watch you, and guess what? You probably slightly change what you do at every single listing and buying presentation. And it's extremely difficult. So they have duplicatable systems, the science. Not the art, not the talent, not the way you deliver, but what you're saying, right? So they're gonna be able to duplicate based on the business. So where are we trying to get to? If you want to have personal leadership, you want to be able to rebel, you want to be able to be strong and build what you need to build, we know that you're only going to be in 2% of the population. And to me, I think that's really important to remember because that tells you when you make some moves that might be great in your business, they might be great in your life, do you think everybody's going to cheer you on? No. 
I can tell you business can be crazy. People can do crazy things. Like you don't see it coming. Like you're like, what did they do? How, like how could this happen? And I'm very logical, so I don't see things like that coming. So that's not logical. That doesn't make sense. Why would somebody do that? But it does. So for me, what I realize is sometimes when you make the right moves, the world doesn't cheer you on. Not until later. Right? So having that leadership to say, hey, I'm okay for going for my dreams and having confidence and exploring new things, choosing happiness, fulfillment, because the other side of it, I get to have more friends, but I don't really get to do much with my life. So for me, it's not a great trade-off. It's popularity versus the rebellion and the leadership side of things. Anybody experienced that? You did something great for yourself and the people around you were kind of just pulling you back and like, why are you supporting me on this? Just me? Yeah, okay. All right, the whole purpose of education is to turn mirrors into windows. Um, what this means is basically, it's this, the same thing as the first slide, right? We see the world based on how we are, not based on as the world is. So if I see things as limited, all I'm gonna see around me is those exact same, exact same beliefs. So the more training that we can do and the more developed we are in our mindset, we're gonna be able to see that there's so many more opportunities out there for all of us, for every single person. And I see this a lot, I think it's amazing um, with my children, because they'll, they'll kind of mirror back to me, my son was saying that he was wanting to do, asked to do a uh, essay, sorry, a project, on who should be the next prime minister or premier, I can't remember, I think it was premier. And so I'm waiting, right, for him to tell me all of this. I'm like, okay, so who did you pick? He's like, well, I picked you, mom. I'm like, what do you mean? Why would I, I'm not in politics, probably not a good idea. I'm not that involved in politics. I said, why would you do that? He's like, because you'll always show up. You work harder than anyone I know. Like, I don't understand. Like, you'll just put your mind to something and you'll work at it. And I think you can have that same opportunity. Why aren't you going for premier, mom? And they were serious. They're sitting there looking at me like, How? like that's not my life choice. Thank you, I appreciate it. Not my life choice. But what I see for me with those mirrors or those windows are people around me who see opportunities for themselves, right? When I look around, I see people's capability. That's what makes me a great coach. So all of us have mirrors. I'm gonna encourage you to see what mirrors are around you because sometimes they're other people. And to me, I'm really selective about who are those other people who are around me because if they can't see my potential or invest in it or mirror it to me, I might see their opinion. And that might not be too great for me, right? This is one of the benefits of team. Teams usually see and encourage each other's potential. And sometimes they see potential in others that they don't even see in themselves yet. And they'll invest in that. And that to me is pretty unique in a market as competitive as real estate, to be around people who actually see your magnificence, magnificence and invest in it. Because no one gets to the corner office by sitting on the side table and not at the table. I think when we're talking about leadership, it's really important to remember that we want all leaders. Right? We want all leaders. We want women leaders, we want men leaders, we want different cultures, right? different nationalities. We want all leaders. And because real estate, obviously, we have a lot of women and we have managers and people who are promoting them in teams, we know it often, it needs to, a woman needs to be asked seven times to take a leadership position before they'll consider the role. A man needs to be asked once. And when they do research on this, there's so many different reasons for it, right? Women are more likely to say, I'm not qualified yet, or I don't know how to do it yet, or I might have children, or I might need to take some time to be home. But what's happening is we're missing out on some amazing leaders. So I'm going to be talking about leadership today, and I think it's fair to say this is a really important topic. I went to Synergy. Does anybody hear about Synergy Conference? It's in New York. So I went to Synergy. Super cool. I got to meet a bunch of great people. Simon Sinek. I'm going to forget. Who else did I meet? Gary Vanderchuk. A whole bunch of them, right? Fantastic. So I'm sitting there because I'm looking to ramp up Ultimate Team Summit. So I wanted to go and model success. I thought, go to a massive conference and see what they're doing and model it so I can scale it. I believe you can model what works. And I went through the two full days of that conference and there was not a single key featured female speaker, not one. And I'm sitting there going, I'm here to model the next step. And I keep looking for it, I'm like, why isn't it there? What's going on with leadership that we're not promoting these voices? And I don't think it's just important to me. I think it's important to everybody in real estate personally. So that's, that's my spot of that. And multifaceted uh, leadership, 
Again, with teens, I'm going to tell you a little story about Sarah. So Sarah is a friend of mine. She also happens to be an engineer. And she told me an amazing story that now she's in a program that she's going to become a full, um, what did they call it, manager for the full, uh, I'm going to say branch, plant, not branch, for the entire plant on shift. So this is an incredible responsibility. You actually train intensively for four years just to get the opportunity for what she's going to do. But she told me a story when she first started with the company. And she had a manager who came to her at one point because a job was posted. So a job was posted for an advancement. She didn't think anything of it. She's like, oh, that's great. Yeah, she didn't even consider it. The manager comes to her the day before it was going to be taken off and says, Sarah, what's going on? I really thought you would come forward for this position. She's like, me? Why? I'm not qualified for this. I can't do this. Like, I don't know why you would even think of this. And I'm listening to this story. And Sarah is so articulate. Like she, People are just drawn to talk to her. She's so intelligent. She's powerful. She's educated. She's so many amazing things. But she couldn't see herself in this role. And great leaders. They see in others what they don't see in themselves yet. They mirror magnificence to them so they can see it. So what happened was Sarah did, she did apply and she did get the position and this is many years ago now. But we were talking about this in a room of several people and a couple people piped up and they said, yeah, but what if the manager went to everybody? What if the manager went to all the people under him and said, oh, you should go forward for this position. Is it really authentic? Should we really trust these leaders? And what I said was, it doesn't matter. If you're in a team or you're in a brokerage and you see people who you think might be capable of something, mirror it back to every single one of them. Because if people have an inkling that they're capable of it, they'll come forward. So we need to not just lead up or lead down. We need to lead in all directions to show people that they have capabilities they don't see yet. Having a mentor who sees your capabilities is a privilege very few actually have. I don't know about for you, but I didn't grow up with that privilege. I had some great insight from my father, but I left home very, very young. I went to university and I borrowed money from my grandmother to do frost week. I guess I didn't really think I needed money for laundry, right? <laughs> because I had OSA. So I was like, I need money to party the first week, right? So it was pretty interesting a couple weeks in. I was like, okay, I guess I'm hand washing clothes. We'll see how this goes. So it's really important to remember, leadership is a beautiful privilege that we can give others. It's not just for ourselves. So I believe in mirrors, and I've seen teams do amazing things, and brokerages, and brokerage managers, and even people just helping each other in offices to help people move forward. As above, so, or sorry, as, as above, so below, as below, so above. So how we see ourselves inside, I believe, is what is going to be mirrored around us. So we spend a lot of time with teams looking at, like you said, their desires, their motivations, their beliefs, their values, what makes people tick. So in university, I did end up to graduate, good thing, and I ended up to switch from journalism to psychology. So I always had an interest in how people are motivated, right? How can you help people to get on the right track so they feel fulfilled? Anybody here ever won an award in real estate and got the award and felt like, yeah, that's great, but I don't really feel anything? <laughs> I, I, I'm, t I'm telling you, every, everybody is searching for something. So Ultimate Team Summit, I have people who come and say, oh my gosh, I've always looked up to those people and their business is perfect and they're doing so many deals. But inside, that person's searching for something too, right? And in the end of the day, if they're not in alignment or they don't feel fulfilled on the inside, that award isn't going to be anything for us. And it's not going to help us elevate or change our industry, right? It's not going to help us give a better client experience. It's an empty wish, essentially. So this is a little piece of it, another workshop that we do, which I'm obviously not doing today. But I'm giving you a little bit of our formula that we work with. And there's three steps that we work with to get to a place of strong leadership. So first is know thyself. Sounds pretty obvious, right? Like I think I know myself. But it's taken me years and years to really know myself, let alone to support my clients to understand themselves. What do they value? Why do they do what they do? Why do they have patterns for what they're doing? Is it serving them or is it not? And are they actually aud audacious enough to say, you know what? I'm going to rebel against who I was yesterday or two days ago because there's something more I can do today. Are they strong and courageous enough to do that? And I would say when people know themselves, they're more likely to take those steps. So know myself. What does that mean? 
It means I understand, again, my values. I understand maybe if you want some testing for it, like Colby or my disk or my rep systems. How do I communicate? How do I process information and knowledge? Um, for me, when I found out my disk, it was really interesting to find out, and my Myers-Briggs, that it was less than 2% of the overall population. Big surprise, right? So I went around my whole life going, why are people so nuts? <laughs> why are people so crazy? And I felt, no, they're probably not crazy. It was more likely me. But it was great to know myself because once I understood that, what did I do? I could adapt. I could communicate differently. I could bring different messages to other people. And most of us in this room are in sales. So that's pretty important to us. Communication is everything. And once I know myself, I can learn to know others and understand them. But until I see that I have a unique way of processing and communicating, I can't really adapt to other people. And that actually means a lot to us. So how many people here know their personality profile? Just for example. Okay, so depending on your personality profile, if you're a predominant in one type, the most you would have a market share that would adapt to you naturally without you changing would be 50%. So there's one personality style that's 50% of our population. So just to put this back, if you don't know yourself and your strengths and weaknesses, you could be showing up and using presentations or verbiage or marketing that actually only appeals to 2% of the market. It becomes extremely important to know ourselves because we're communicating how we want to be communicated with and that's not the platinum rule in real estate. The platinum rule is to communicate with others how they want to be communicated with. And I can't do that if I don't know myself. So basically I'm going to say it for myself, if I don't know this, I'm kind of a train wreck in my business because I can't see my enemies. Seriously, I can't see my enemies before me. I don't know. So I don't know what to target. So when you're talking about working with teams, right, who are doing 200, 300, 400, 600,000 deals plus, these things become extremely important. We can't afford to limit our market share when we're putting so much into marketing out to the public, right? We don't have a choice with those things. And live in our unique ability. I can say I'm not great at lots of things, but I'm really, really good at a few. And I limit what I'm doing to those things. So that again, I'm not showing up as, as a train wreck out there. Um, team, our belief in team is to live in unique ability and partner with others who live in unique ability. So instead of partnering with somebody who's just like me, have, has anybody here done a partnership and it didn't work out in real estate? Not in marriage, in <laughs> real estate. That's not today's topic. Okay, yeah, all right. So in real estate, I, I, can, I can advise on that topic, okay. So in real estate, what happens often, we go to partner with somebody and we don't see it. We, most people, I'd say nine out of 10, people call me, so I think I'm gonna have a partner, this will be great. I'm going, okay, well, what's their strengths? What's their personality? What do they love to do that you don't like to do? Okay, are you actually, it usually turns out they're just swapping time. Like I want a Saturday off, they want a Sunday off, that's great, if that's what you want, that works. But if you partner with somebody who's exactly you, there's no leverage. There's no team unless you have other aspects of the run, like a team behind you supporting the marketing, lead generation, the conversion, all of that fun stuff. So we want to figure out and live in our unique ability. There's something else that's great about unique ability. It energizes us. In real estate, we have those ups and downs, and I've had so many people say, I'm thinking of leaving the industry, or I'm burnt out, or is this for me? But they weren't looking for the joy. Right? They weren't looking for the unique ability that energizes them and makes them feel fulfilled. How many people here purposely in the morning set a, a, a intention to find joy or happiness or fulfillment or whatever it is that you want that day with your clients? How many people set it as an intention? Just that little thing, you can say it's fluffy, and I'm not usually too fluffy, but you, just that little thing can make a massive difference in your business. I've had people turn from wanting to leave the real estate industry to coming back and saying, wow, I feel really good just because they look for that joyful engagement with their clients. And then they saw it. They weren't looking for it before. So how do we get all this going, right? Because this is about in, uh, leadership and uh, building. Not, I wanted to say team, but that's not today, sorry. So momentum, how do we get it going? We want to first have a vision. How many people here set goals? Cool, okay. How many people have a vision that they feel compelled? Like they're committed to it 100%, like guess what, get out of my way because I'm doing this. Like I expect the world's gonna flow with me, but this is gonna happen. How many people are like 100% in? Yeah, cool, okay. So if your vision is that compelling, that you're 100% in, that means you're gonna have more believability. And believability is the only reason you're gonna act. 
So that's why people do all this goal setting every year and they set the same goals again and again and again. And my clients will do it. I'll check their goals. I don't tell them until after they don't like that. But they send it and I'll be like, wait a minute, you set these goals last year. Why are you setting the same goals? Did you not build the garage? Did you not do the landscaping in the back? Did you not go to the personal trainer? Like, why did you hit all your business goals but none of your personal goals? This is about overall performance. That's what leadership is. They'll say, well, I was so busy selling. You know, I didn't get it done. And when we actually went behind it, they didn't believe they could sell, their, sell as much as their goals were and actually hit all of their personal targets, which was a problem. To me, that's a failure because they weren't feeling fulfilled. So we needed to go back and reset the believability. So if we're trying to take action, we need to believe that we can actually have a positive outcome. Only then will we take action and get the result. So if you're working with, you know, buyer presentation, listing presentation, scripting, I spend a ton of time scripting, I'll do it in my sleep. If I ever get Alzheimer's, this isn't wood, but I, I don't know, I will probably be saying that it's scripting somewhere because I know it's so well ingrained on conversion scripting. But when people are only kind of trained on a system and they take action, the public will train you on what to do and what not to do 10 million times more than a coach or trainer ever could. And I'll tell you this, the public is not gonna help you get better results typically <laughs> with their feedback. So if you don't have mastery or belief and you don't take the time to nurture the belief before you take action, the systems probably won't work for you. And that's a big part of my life, but how many people here have goals to improve or, or build their production? How many people actually wanna sell more houses this year and you're serious about it? Yeah, you might want to check your values too. How many people here have done values work? Like their core values? A few? Okay, if, just to give you a tip, if you're hitting a hurdle, like a cap, and every year you're coming close to that same cap, you might want to do some values work. You can do it with a life coach, you can do it with us, you can do it in online programs, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but it's really interesting that if your values mean, hey, I want to spend a certain amount of time with my family, I want to pay my mortgage, I want to save X amount of money for investments or RSPs, once you've done that, at the end of the day, your values, when you have to get up and go for an extra open house, or you need to do some extra prospecting, what do you think your, your internal brain is gonna say? No, 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 but I wanna spend time with family. Or I wanna go on another trip. No, I just wanna go out and go for a walk today. Your internal brain, your values are nine times more powerful than your conscious mind. Your values are the goal getter, your conscious mind is the goal setter. So you can tell me, yourself, anyone else that you want to do whatever you say, but at the end of the day, if your values are in alignment, you're fighting yourself. And that's why people get caps again and again and again. Has anyone experienced it? I've experienced it in my business. Yeah, with the kids, you know, there's guilt and pe people around me like, well, why are, you know, you should be spending more time with the kids and you're out selling and now you're coaching and you're doing all this stuff. And I realized it took me a long time to realize the exact same people who were whispering in my kids' ears, you know, Ethan, your mom should be cleaning your room for you. <laughs> so when Ethan comes home and says, Mom, Baba said you're supposed to clean my room for me. <laughs> like, that's interesting. Good for Baba. She can clean it. Um, but over time, I really realized those exact same people were the same people if I was sitting at home and getting social assistance who would have said to me, Kathleen, you should get up and work. And knowing my values really helped me to be powerful in those situations so I wasn't divided. I knew where to put my energy and my focus. So I wanted to make sure that I was having a clear vision. It wasn't being put off by energy of other people around me. I had belief in what I could do, take action, then I could get a positive result. It's gonna reinforce that it's gonna work and set a habit for me. Seems like a little thing, but teams are built in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these cycles going over again and again and again, because as soon as we can hold a system, we can add to it. As soon as we can hold a habit, we can add to it. And what's amazing is, the people, once they've been through this 10 or 20 times, recurring in different areas of their business, they believe they're powerful. They know they can create change in their lives and in their business, and they're ready to take action because they believe in themselves. So it's, it's a massive uh, framework for us. So path less chosen, uh, I really do believe that you know living with integrity, leading your life your way, what's important to you, is an everyday act of rebellion. I truly believe that. I don't think it's easy. Um, I truly honor how difficult it can be to figure out you know, who you are, what you want, how you want to approach the world. I also think it's what builds the best realtors and it builds the best business because we're in tune with why we do things instead of just the money and the transactions. It's very empty. I used to sell, for me, a lot of homes as a single parent, um, which lots of people have been, right? So it was pretty difficult for me, and I went to a certain point where I felt that emptiness. 
was like, I just, I'm not feeling it, right? It's like I'm helping all these people, I'm winning the awards, I'm making good money, and I had an envelope in my car where I kept all, we used to get checks, right? So I kept all the checks, because I was so scared, what if I didn't have enough money to pay the bill? So I didn't even put it in the bank. I had the envelope like this thick, with all the different checks from the trades. And finally, the brokers called me up, like we finally realized why our numbers are constantly off. Like, what are you doing? Why aren't you cashing your checks? Like, well, because I have these kids and I'm in this state of, of insecurity about finances. So it was really interesting because I had to go through a change. I felt like I was on a you know factory line with my clients. I wasn't connecting, there was no meeting. And that's when I started to do the work with Consultants Approach. It was the first presentation I ever did. It is the bedrock, it's the foundation of every single system we teach today for teams. Every single one. Our psychology of every phone call we make, every presentation we do is all consultants approach. So our belief is that we don't actually have to push, we don't have to manipulate, we don't have to put people in a corner, we don't have to do trial closes, we just need to know who we are, what our role is, and to facilitate giving information. And what I love about this is you get to trust that most people around us are really intelligent. Right? Most people are good people. And if you do a good job educating them, in my experience, most people make good decisions for themselves and for their families. So why do we have to push? Right? Why have all these pushy systems? Because in the end, most people will work with you if we educate them. So everyday acts of rebellion for us is part of having a consultant's approach. And I believe the personal is still uh, political and that how we live is our best example of leadership. Right, The way that we choose to run our businesses. The war is won before it is fought. Um, what does that mean? It means it's all an inside game. If I choose to make actions in my life, it doesn't matter what the outside world thinks of them at all. It was already won on the inside before anybody ever saw it come to be. Um, in my prior business, I had to make some decisions when I left there, and it was really interesting because I again had two kids, and I had to really make some tough calls, and there was somebody around me who said, if you believe in something, you bet your house on it. You bet everything on it, you go all in. And at the end of the day, it was this. It was like, can I look at my kids if I'm not doing the right thing? It's like, I'd rather be destitute and have no house than show up and not do the right thing and live my truth, right? I'd rather do that. So I did. I bet everything on it, and today it worked out because I have a company and it all went well. But at the time, it might have gone a very different way. So war is won before it is, is fought. We're lacking the spirit of enthusiasm, not to say fanaticism, which is so necessary to move the world out of its beaten tracks. It's too intellectual, too little emotional to be an efficient force in history. I believe you gotta have heart, right? How many people here have been an underdog? A couple of us. I think being an underdog is an advantage because you're used to having the stats stacked against you and you show up anyways and you get things done. So essentially this is saying, hey, like where's that enthusiasm and that heart to build something amazing in our industry and to feel uh, confident about what we do? And I believe there's something to come back to that with the professionalism and the service. And that's partly why I work with teams. So the rebel is dismissed as impractical, zealous, chronically misunderstood. The rebel hears only his or her inner voice, which demands steadfast defiance. And the rebel understands that virtue is not rewarded. The rebel expects nothing and gets nothing. So at the end of the day, I can show up and do the right thing, right? I can make sure that I only, now it's different, but I only say there's one offer when there is, instead of saying there's 10 offers when I know there's only five. At the end of the day, I don't expect a reward for doing the right thing, but I get the performance from integrity. So I don't know how many people are relating to what we're talking about. It's okay if you're only taking little pieces of it, it's totally fine. But at the end of the day, integrity is highly correlated to performance. Highly correlated. When I keep my word to myself and I can trust myself, I'm more likely to do what I need to do in my business to build, and I'm more likely to be able to build with other people. So having that energy going in a straight, laser-focused fashion versus all over the place dealing with other aspects of life is very important, and that's part of what we're looking at. So we're getting back to our three-step, know myself, learn to know others, I try every day, and live in our unique ability, that place where we're passionate and we have so much heart for what we do, really key. So how do we do some of this? I'm gonna give you some of the more tangibles uh, now because I had time to do it. When I did this talk before, I, was, I only had a limited, so I need some more tangible. So this is something really cool. How many people have seen it? 
If you haven't, it's totally fine. I'm just curious. Okay, this is the NLP communication model. So NLP is neuro linguistic programming. It means um, studying excellence. So if somebody else can do something amazing, I and they're capable of doing it, I can model them and get as close to those results as possible. So it's the belief that if somebody else can do it, I can probably do it unless they have you know amazing talents. I don't, but I can get as close as possible by modeling them. And I do this work with my clients a lot. If you set a goal this year and you're not really taking action, a really cool exercise is to say, okay, well, what would a person already achieving what I want think? What would they do? What actions would they take? Right? When I'm in the most difficult kind of business decisions, I always stop and I say, what would the absolute ultimate leader do? What would the best of the best do? And it just takes me back into taking action in a way that's in alignment with my personal values. And so this is telling us that we all have filters. So the example of what would the best leader do is saying, hey, I need a filter. What filter am I going to choose? So when you're every day right now, every second, you have two million bits of data coming at you. Everybody in this room does. Two million bits of data. I don't know if you can read it, but how many bits do you think we actually retain? So every second, two million. It could be the sound, the lighting in the room, the language, it could be what somebody's wearing, it could be a smell, everything. Two million bits of data every single second, again and again and again and again. How many do you think we consciously retain? Just guess. You can see it. Okay, thanks. 134. So it's a minimum, right? Because if we took in more data than that, most of us would go into kind of nervous breakdown. Like our brains are not meant to decipher that much. So what actually happens? This is how has anybody had a client call you and be like, you didn't tell me that. I didn't know we had an appointment. What do you mean? You didn't go over that information. All of us have a filter, filters, to delete, distort, and generalize. So based on what I believe as a leader, I believe about myself, I believe about the world, I'm actually filtering everything that happens in line with those beliefs. So you could be in this room right now and you could be like, okay, I don't know who she is, like what, why did Tim bring this person in? Like I don't, know, I don't like her shoes, like you could be, if you're thinking any of that, your filter is gonna be looking for that. They're gonna be like, yeah, this isn't for me, and you're gonna reinforce it. If your goal is, hey, what are, what are some people doing differently in real estate? What's one or two things I could learn from this? Your filter's gonna be looking for value. And you probably heard this from speakers in a different way, but the brain science behind this is extensive now. Way back, they called this the secret. It wasn't just a secret, like way back, man search for me. There's so many different, or as we think it's, sorry, there's so many different books that lead back to the secret. But the brain science now proves exactly that. It's a part of our brain called the reticular activating system. Its full job is to sift and sort everything around you every second of the day based on what you believe, what you think, and what past experiences you've had. So if you're holding on to something that you think you can't get to the next level in your business or you can't expand onto a team, whatever it is for you, or you can't increase your value when people are cutting commission, that's exactly what's going to be true for you because your brain's wired to do that. So getting to know myself is understanding this, going, hey, wait a minute, how am I deleting, distorting, and generalizing? What am I taking in and what am I kind of pushing to the side that might be beneficial for myself and my life? And there's two things that you see here. Once I get the information, there's the two ways that there are two specific habits that are most correlated to entrepreneurial success. Any guesses? I know you guys aren't loving guesses today, but any guesses? <laughs> two habits most correlated with entrepreneurial success. What do you think? What might entrepreneurs do that keep them on their game? Consistency. Exercise and? Brain Okay, yeah. It's exercise, physical exercise, and meditation or focused thought, exactly that, focused thought, prayer, whatever you call it, it's really, any of those, right? Um, those are the two things. And what's amazing is when they do the brain science, it backs up exactly that. So there are two ways to change your state. What state I'm in, my full body, my mind, everything. Two ways. One, physiology. I can get up, I can move, I can exercise, I can do you know power poses before I talk, I can do all that stuff. That will change my state of mind, it 100% will. The other is internal representation. So when something happens around me, I choose. Is it good, is it bad, is it neutral? I actually choose it. So when I make that choice, it mixes with my body and I have a physical reaction. So if I'm in my day and I'm having a really bad day with clients and somebody says something to me and I'm upset about it, how long do you think my body's actually reacting? How long do you think that, that, that the chemical reaction is actually happening that I was upset? What do you think? I had someone once tell me a week. <laughs> you, you've been arguing with a client, your, your body's upset for a week? Oh my goodness, so it's 12 minutes. 
It's actually 12 minutes. So your body's totally over the fact that you were upset in 12 minutes. So what happens after is we think about it again and again and again and again, and we keep having those reactions. So state management is everything. If you go to Tony Robbins, state management 101, it's like the foundation of the work that they do there. It's massive. So if we understand this, we really know ourselves, and we can put ourselves in optimal state. All client decisions are state driven, all of them. So if we show up and our client state is completely shut down and we don't understand this, we can talk to her blue in the face, it doesn't matter. You're not gonna get the outcome, right? So they're not open to it. So this is a lot of the work we do to make sure our systems get that extra edge when it comes to results. So that leads us to when are we in optimal performance and what does this have to do with teams? So this is looking at brain activity versus performance. I spend a lot of time here because I work with teams and I wanna serve them. So what we know is that performance is actually the same when I'm bored and I'm totally disengaged and I'm just like checking out as it is when I'm completely overwhelmed and stressed. Sounds weird, right? You're like, oh, but I'm all zen, hippie at the cottage, I'm not doing anything, I'm a great performance. Well, no, I'm at the exact same place as if I'm completely overwhelmed. Optimal performance is when I'm in the midway, right? Status quo midway. My brain is not too much, there's not too much going on, and I'm actually able to stay in calm. Why? Because it's state management. If I'm in the middle section, I'm not too stressed, I'm not too upset, I'm able to be calm and make proactive decisions. This is really cool for teams, because teams you can leverage other facets of your business. So if I'm not great at paperwork, let's just say, or I don't have a lot of patience to put up sold signs or lock boxes, which let's just say might be true, it might, right? So let's just say that those little things in the business irritated me, whatever. I could have done my work to get over it, I could have, but instead I decided I could leverage other people. Because if I didn't have to do those little things, my brain was more calm, I was more efficient, I was better at my job, I could do exponentially more deals. So we understand that we're actually at our optimal performance when we're midway and we're able to not get too stressed or too frantic, which is exactly the opposite of that idea of hustle and grind, right? That you keep hustling, you keep pushing constantly that you're going to have more sales. Really, you're probably gonna burn out from stress and you're not gonna get back up to your optimal until you've gone all the way back to boredom and you get back up and you're gonna be pushed right back over. That's the hills and valleys. So teams have a big piece of this, I don't have enough time to get into that today, but they allow us that if I'm doing what I'm great at, I don't have as much stress, I have more fulfillment, and I can have more ease to make more money, essentially, overall. So if we are looking to support each other as a brokerage, or as a team, what would be the top things that we might look for? So the ingredients of star performance, I don't know if you can read this, I'll read it in case. So if we're looking at IQ and technical skills versus emotional intelligence, we'll talk about what that is, all jobs of any kind, still emotional intelligence is almost double in importance as my technical competence. So this I hope explains a little bit of why my talk is the way it is. Because I can talk phone scripts, I can talk presentations, listing system, buyer system, I can do it in my sleep. I've done it for years and they're pretty good just to say. But they're not gonna be where you get the maximum amount of results. You're gonna get the maximum amount of results from yourself energizing those systems and that's what the blue is identifying. So it's where my mindset is and where my capabilities are, where my performance is. When you look at leadership positions, it's four to five times more important to have emotional intelligence than it is to actually have IQ and technical skills, right? So knowing how to do my job, ironically, is drastically less important than understanding who I am, understanding the dynamics of other people around me and how to engage with those people. That this is why, as we move to artificial intelligence and so, so many people are scared about real estate, they can't yet re replicate the human experience. Your experience with clients years after years, your ability to analyze information and create confidence and trust for others is not something artificial intelligence can replicate. It's a massive advantage for us. Teams are, are very ahead, in my opinion, in protecting their businesses with this because they have the understanding of leadership and confidence and that it's, it rubs off, it's contagious with other people. So what is emotional intelligence, just for those of you who are looking and saying this is great, but what does it mean? Self-awareness, social awareness, what's going on around me, self-management, relationship management, and then I'm able to have a positive impact on others. So I don't think it's by accident that we've seen this transition in um, coaching platforms, in business platforms. I've said many times, I think business coaching is a thing of the past. I don't believe in it. I believe in performance coaching. 
There's no one that I've ever coached that we only coached on systems presentations, you know, um, business plans, even disc personality. We're coaching on ensuring that they're at their optimal performance in every area of their life. That's how their real estate businesses thrive. So the idea that you can see a business coach and your business is going to go through the roof, it's only going to go through the roof as much as the rest of your life is strong and integrous and complete. And that's why I believe coaching has changed so much and not by accident will help us as a real estate industry adjust in my personal opinion experience. So what are some of the tasks? that we can take from this. If you want to run with just some little pieces of this, sometimes I can be too detailed or intense, so I try to like, okay, takeaways. <laughs> Let's have some set takeaways. So number one, take an educated risk, right? One little educated risk. Years ago, I really wanted to give time to community. I wanted to do leadership work in my community, and I was so busy, but I said, I'm gonna send three emails, because I had set a goal and I wanted to take action. So I sent three emails to community organizations around us. We're located in Durham region, so not far, obviously. And I only had one of them come back, but I said, I'm gonna be giving time to a community organization to support leadership and mindset for, you know, let me know, can I be of service? Why should I work with the organization? What can I do? Only one of them got back to me, and they ended up to be having a weekend, it's called Girls' Day Out for us, um, it's by Girls Inc. And it's to support, you know, youth and women in claiming leadership, building their lives, being strong, being confident. And by the time they got back to me and I pre-booked it, I was so busy. I was swamped, I was like, how can I possibly do this? But I'd already taken an educated risk. I already knew I was gonna get really busy and community involvement's important to me, so I committed myself to it. I showed up, it was my first non-real estate talk. I thought I was gonna be sick. I was like, what am I gonna say to these people? I teach real estate, this was a long time ago. Um, I didn't necessarily work with the tools I do now, but I left and it was the biggest natural high I've ever had because it was something that was so important to me and the year would have gone away and I wouldn't have done it. So just take an educated risk. If there's something you really want to do, put it out there. See what comes back to you. Number two, laser focused. Our clients, over 80% of our clients are top 1% nationally. They, they, like hands down, and that's where they're at. Even them, they'll come to coaching and say, well, I signed up for this new thing, or I'm gonna you know, go on this retreat. And sometimes they're like, but that's not in line with what you want to achieve this year. Right? Laser focus means you often have to say no to things that seem really shiny and nice and would be a nice break from the work we actually have to do because you're having a strategy to build what you want. Right? Laser focus isn't always fun, but it gets you results. Third, unique ability. So how many people feel they know what their unique ability is? Or abilities. I shouldn't say ability. Abilities. First of all, everyone has one. At least. Everyone. I've done full training on unique ability and had people come up and, and in tears and say, I really don't think I have a unique ability. Like every single person has a unique ability. You just don't know it yet. But you know who does know it? Everybody around you. It's easier for other people to see your strengths than it is for you. So if you don't feel like you know, ask people around you, hey, what do you think I'm good at? What do you count on me for? If you needed something from me, what might it be? Right, unique ability, another question is, if you had to pick one thing to do for the rest of your life for free, what would you choose? One thing, I had a gentleman in my training, I did in brokerages uh, for years, and he said, you know what, I used to go and volunteer with a basketball league for youth, like young men. He's like, I did it for years, I don't even know why I stopped, I was just building my real estate business, but I loved it. And he actually went back when he realized he would do it for free forever and started to do that again and engage in it. And his real estate business is fulfilling as well because he has that positive energy. And number four, plant seeds or have a net cast over you. My whole life, people have told me I can't do something. Kathleen, you can't go to university, you have no money, your parents aren't gonna help you. Kathleen, you can't graduate from university because you have a baby. Kathleen, you can't have suitable housing because where are you gonna have your child? You're gonna have to rent a room. You're not gonna be able to sell houses because you have two little kids, how are you gonna do this? Or Kathleen, you're not gonna be able to do this on your own, guess what, you're, you're gonna need me, right? So my whole life, I've had people tell me I can't. And my whole life, I'm used to the fact that I'm gonna show up and do it anyway. Guess what, this isn't my first time around. Like it's, it doesn't matter, because I know who I am and I know what I'm committed to. And that's why this is so very important. You either have a net cast over you by what everyone else is gonna tell you you can't do and you can't achieve, or you plant seeds and you plant your own garden. And the mindset of that is phenomenal. Everything I built didn't come from other people saying you can build it. It came from me nurturing it and there was no hope in anything that it was ever gonna to come to fruition. And I nurtured it anyways. We had a change in our team now, just before Team Summit. It was a big change. 
and it was a really hard decision for me. I won't get into it, but very, very hard. It tugged on my heart. It was extremely hard for me, and it caused some changes in our team, and I know it had to be made because my values are very clear, and I knew that there were things that were happening that were not in alignment with my values, and that, to me, wasn't fair for our clientele to be part of. So I had to plant some new seeds, and I had to have faith that 60 to 90 days minimum, you're not going to see any signs of anything positive happening from it. The work is to hold the faith that what you're planting is going to come to fruition. And again, 60 to 90 days, you're not going to think you have anything, anything. So when there's nothing around, I'm like, oh my gosh, my whole team might leave. What am I going to do? My head down, no. I know what I'm building. My job is to go back to exactly what I'm building. I'm going to act in alignment with that no matter what the outside world does. So not, give yourself 90 days to have even a sign that anything's gonna work when you're planting new seeds in your business. Any client of mine who's built their teams, and most of the big ones built from scratch, I can tell you, like, they had to act on blind faith again and again and again and again. It was not easy for them. That's what has built their business to this point. So, which I'm sure I'll have somebody check time for me in a minute, but, uh, Drew. But when strategy is not aligned with culture, culture wins all the time. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Who's around you? What do they believe in? New followers, new people that come into a team or a brokerage or a family, they don't follow the leaders. They follow the followers. So if you, you want to have that rule of, hey, what's our culture all about? Like I can come in with systems and mindset and a team whose culture is negative and um, lacking optimism, it's not going to matter. They're going to say it's not going to work. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go, those beliefs will spread around the entire team. Watch for the changes in language. Whether it's in your home, it's in your team, it's with your friends, watch for the language. Language shows what's really going on. A team that's having transitions, the language, is, the language will change about client experience, about you know, reverence for their clients and taking care of them versus, oh yeah, you know, we have this house and it's garbage, but I got the listing, I'm just gonna put it out there anyway. That says a lot about the culture of that team, right? And how much they care for the people that they work with. And when you hear me say team, you guys know it doesn't matter, brokerage office, team, like we're all teams. Right, I'm just, it's my language, so forgive that side of me because I'm with team uh, all the time. And run the marathon, as I just said, 90 days, right? Delayed gratification equals success over time. How can we build something that's so worthwhile that we're willing to toll over it again and again and again, even when there's no sign we're gonna get to that, um, get to that end game? This is how the big teams have been built. So I'll tell you a true story, just to kind of explain why I'm talking about this a couple times. I had somebody call my office a couple months ago now. He's same call I've had many, many times, probably hundreds of times in the coaching business. But somebody called my office and he said, I want to talk to you because I'm good friends with so-and-so and you've coached so-and-so for years. And years ago, I saw his business take off. It exploded out of nowhere. Like, I couldn't believe it. And I just talked to him about my mastermind and it looks like his business is going to explode again. So here's the interesting thing. Okay? This person did not jump on board with what that particular client was doing years ago. And now he wants to jump on board because it's the second explosion in his business. Here's the truth of that conversation. I was totally caught off guard because first of all, he hadn't told me who it was right away. I'm going, who had an explosion in their business? Who, who the heck are they talking about? Like, what? And then I hear them. Then they tell me the name. I'm like, yeah, they've done really well, but that was our plan. Like, that was our strategy. We built slowly, consistently for several years now. Like, it's no shock that they're, you know, top in their district and they're selling X number of homes. That's not a shock. That was actually strategic. But from the outside, it looks like this big explosion of their business, right? Like, oh my gosh, look how many houses they're selling. From the inside, I'm going to show you. I think I brought the chart. I'll go through. So how we experience growth looks like this. Even for me, coaching with my clients, it's like, okay, keep them with it. Like, keep with it. Build the structure, build the structure, build the structure, even though you don't see any results. Because I promise you, the reality is this. There's a trajectory for growth. And when you're investing in your business, it feels like you're getting nowhere. Because when we're in a sales environment, we have immediate gratification. I sell the house, I get the firm deal, I get the trade, I get the sales award, right? It feels like I'm winning. When you start to build your actual business and expand it and duplicate it, if you want team, it feels very different because you're building in a more stagnant fashion that will give you exponential growth later. It's a very different experience and it can feel almost backwards. Like I shouldn't be having this slow structured time. I need to get out there and sell houses, right? It feels a little bit off. Every success I had in sales was from being in the fast lane. 
every single one. It was like, keep me, my focus right here. Don't bug me anything outside of this lane and at all. Like to the point it would irritate me. It was like, no, 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 I have my system. I'm very successful. Stay everything outside of that lane somebody else does and don't bug me with it. That's it. That was my recipe for success. In coaching, to walk off of that fast lane and completely you're doing what looks like sideways work until it comes back around and supports you. It's a very different experience. So it's in a sea of thousand alignments that we create a tidal wave of change over time. It's in those small, tiny investments, right? Again and again and again. It was several years ago after a Canadian team summit that I had a Jerry Maguire moment and I sent an email to all of my clients totally excited when you run a summit, it's three days, it's kind of intensive, your mind gets a bit tired. So I sent this email going, we're going to be an international company, I want to serve and support performance, growth, and my clients, a couple of them came back to me, this is amazing, somebody actually asked me about Chuck Charlton today, he was one of the ones. He came back and he's like, yeah, you have to live your dream, you're not just here to support our dream, but not everybody was as excited about it. And I called out for that vision or that dream and it knocked my life completely sideways, took away, I had to change many associations, made many friends, business partners, completely turned my life upside down. But guess what it laid the, led the way for? Everything I asked for, everything. It created the ability to have my company, to connect with people, to have authentic voice. So when you call out for big things, you keep toiling at it, sometimes life disrupts you so that you can have it. It happens for us, not to us, right? Makes sense? Anybody have a big dream like that they're working on now? If you have one, you want to own it. Be like, yeah, guess what? I'm showing up. I've got the dream. Get out of my way or get on board. That's it. That's the reality. That's the commitment. So the question becomes, can we make these changes with grace and courage? Can we follow the playbook for that long game of life? Because I'm not going to get a win every quarter, every year when I'm building a legacy of my life. I'm not. I'm not going to get those awards again and again. It's a long game. It's sometimes a, sol a game of solitude, right? Are we that committed? And finally, that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about, that in real estate, I've already kind of alluded to it, but as artificial intelligence becomes more and more prominent and the risks of us becoming, you know, like Uber and having uh, less kind of one-on-one -on -one real estate representation, we've seen the shift into wisdom work or knowledge work a long time ago, Stephen Covey actually predicted it in his eight uh, six, uh, principles of habits of success. And that's what we're seeing that transition. So that perception, we're going into that wisdom era where my experience and my perception and my ability to analyze is the most valuable thing I can bring to the market. Nobody else knows the experience of going through multiple offer after multiple offer and how it plays out. They have a perception of it that doesn't come from being a real estate specialist. So we don't know our value and how to articulate it, we're going to have a very difficult time. Very difficult. I believe realtors in general have an extremely difficult time articulating their value to themselves, let alone to the public, which makes it hard for us to grow and thrive. So we need to get firmly planted into what we are doing that is of value to the public. And I would say there are teams who are doing that, who are charging on average a point above their local area consistently. And it's not by accident. They know the value of what they're doing. They know the experience that they're delivering for the client. The highest paid positions are paid to think. They're not paid to punch in regular hours. They're not paid to do rudimentary tasks. They're paid to analyze, plan, strategically, and align a vision. How many people would agree that's exactly what we do with a great experience with every single client we work with? I believe it is. And I believe with our clients, everything we do is to work towards this understanding so I can show up powerful. The greater energy wins. If I'm more committed to excellence and I'm with a client, I have a great strategy for them, and I'm more committed and my energy is higher, I'm probably going to lead that process. I'm probably going to get a new client, a buyer or a seller. So I need to be that strong in any of those areas. So at this point, again, certainty is going to equal action and that level of mastery. And I will leave it at the same for uh, takeaways. That's just a workshop that we have. Um, if you're interested in everything we do, we have some information at the back. And um, yeah, if we see anything from Facebook from you guys, we'll also send you a couple of other uh, promotions. But I appreciate your time. It's been fantastic to be here with you. And I'll let uh, Tim, I think, is here, come back. Thank you.
Well, that wraps up our actual meeting today. I want to provide you with some insights, not just from a financial side and from the market side, but also the mindset. Um, when you know, Katrina I and I talked about her coming here as a keynote speaker, the biggest, biggest uh, takeaway we wanted was that leadership and teamwork. Leadership meaning to, to you're, you're not just a paperwork pusher, you're not just, you don't sell houses, because nobody sells houses. Nobody has ever sold a house. I have never, ever, ever sold a house. I've always dealt with people who had needs, and I've helped them achieve their goals of homeownership. I've made sense of the numbers, I've made sense of the paperwork, that's the byproduct of what they actually uh, are doing. It's a human industry. And I want to thank Kathleen for bringing that uh, to a real conversation. And with that, I want to wish you a wonderful day. If you have any questions for me after the meeting, you want to come up to us and talk about anything, I'll be sitting around. Thank you.